Well, we've been going through some of the small books, the so-called minor prophets. And tonight we're going to just take a look at the book called Haggai. Haggai. Haggai is one of the first of what's called the post-exile prophets. As you're, I'm sure, aware that one of the major milestones in Israel's history, one of the major watersheds, in a sense, of uh, the Old Testament historical background, is the Babylonian captivity. When finally God uses uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to judge the kingdom of Judah and takes them into slavery for 70 years. Much of what we've been talking about has been anticipatory to that. The prophets of uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and others uh, anticipated that. Jeremiah and Ezekiel uh, prophesying during that captivity. But there are three historical books of the Old Testament that deal with history after the Babylonian captivity. Ezra, Nehemiah, and the book of Esther. So they're called the post-exile history books. There happen to be three prophets that prophesied after the return from the Babylonian captivity. And uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi being the, uh, the three prophets that uh, are called post-exile prophets. Zechariah prophesies about two months after Haggai. Malachi about a century later. And most people view Malachi as closing the Old Testament. And in a, in a list of book sense, it certainly did. The book, the, but that's going to be misleading unless you recognize the Old Testament actually closes in a sense, in a theological sense, with John the Baptist. But that's another subject. The background historically for Haggai is in Ezra, especially chapters 5 and 6. He's referenced there, as a matter of fact. But that'll all develop as we get into the book. The theme of the book of Haggai has to do with the rebuilding of the temple. And that should have, that'll have a lot of application, not only to Israel today, in some respects, but certainly in our own lives, as I think we'll see as we get into it. The Hebrew word hag means festival. All the different, you know, the, the, the Feast of Weeks and so forth all have Jewish names, hag something or other. Haggai really just means my festival. Uh, the style of Haggai is going to be very different than some of the prophets that we've been studying. Some of these prophets are very poetic. Some of them are very heavy in a, in a very, very uh, burdensome way. Haggai is very different. He's very practical, very down to earth, very direct, quite different. So uh, probably the best way to do this is to jump into the book of Haggai, chapter 1. The first 11 verses really are a challenge to the people. The, the time period here is about 518, 520, 518, depending on which authorities you're looking at, uh, B.C. The year that we're dealing with here was not very significant in secular history, but it's obviously very significant for God's history because he appointed Haggai uh, to uh, deal with it and to record what happened. And if we get through the book in the time we have, I'll share with you some interesting speculations that, occur, that emerge from uh, some of, the, from some of the, the records here. But let's, we want to get the substance of it first before we get into the, the, uh, the fringe areas. About 16 years earlier, the Persian Emperor Cyrus had issued a decree permitting the Jewish exiles in Babylon to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. This is in Ezra chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 5, when Babylon fell under the... Uh, I start to say uh, uh, leadership. That's the wrong word to use for Belshazzar. But anyway, as, uh, as uh, he presumes on the uh, impregnability of Babylon to his, to his uh, failure, uh, that night when the handwriting was on the wall, you all know the story how the, uh, Cyrus had his general have the uh, Euphrates dammed. So the water level went down and the Persian troops were able to slip under the gates and just take over the city without a battle. Babylon fell. When Babylon, about ten days later, when Cyrus makes his big entrance, uh, none other than Daniel, according to the Talmud, uh, shows uh, the emperor, emperor, the Persian emperor, in the book of Isaiah, a letter written to him by God himself, calling him by name and outlining his history, outlining his career. Cyrus, is, that's the, in uh, chapters 44 and 45 of Isaiah. This is all by way of review. I won't take the time to get into detail here. But the point is that, that Cyrus is so impressed... In fact, he's called by name. God says, I'm, I'm surnaming you, even though you don't know me. Written over 100 years before Cyrus was born. 
And uh, so Cyrus is impressed, it's a matter of history, that he then issues an edict to let these slaves, these captives, these, these, these uh, uh, captive Jews, go home, go home to their homeland. And in fact, he gives them financial incentives to go home. And that, of course, is the return. That's the regathering of uh, Judah back to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. Now, that date, by the way, is a very interesting date because it's exactly 70 years from the day they were originally captured uh, by Belshazzar's uh, uh, grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. So that's a very famous event in Jewish history, a very famous event in secular history, for that matter. Now, we hear so much about the the return back to Jerusalem. There were less than 50,000 involved. That may come as a surprise. Uh, We have um, about... 49,897. There are 42,360 basic captives plus about 7,337 servants. That's kind of interesting. And 200 singers that are listed in the scripture. So it was not a big crowd and as you might try to visualize it. Yeah, a lot of the Jews were perfectly happy in Babylon. They're perfectly content in Babylon. When I read about this, do some background, I'm always amused because I see a very interesting analogy today. You know, not all Jews are going back to Israel. You know, a lot of them are making, you know, six-figure incomes in New York and like it here and, you know, whatever. So, interesting. They return, about 50,000 return under um, a newly appointed governor of Judah, a guy by the name of Zerubbabel. He's also called Shezbazar in a couple passages there. And also Joshua the high priest. Don't confuse that with Joshua, of course, of the ancient Joshua. This is Joshua the high priest. So they go back to rebuild. They cleared the rubble from the temple court. Uh, they replaced uh, the altar, the altar of, so they could have uh, sacrifices. So they're able to start sacrificing and having uh, observances before the temple's rebuilt. Uh, so they allow the daily sacrifice to begin. Uh, and by the spring of the following year, they have laid the foundations for the temple. But that's when troubles began. All kinds of uh, tribes around there started to harass them, especially the Samaritans. These are the people that had been transplanted or descended from those who were transplanted by the Assyrians uh, a century earlier, more than this, almost two centuries earlier. Um, When Assyria overran the northern kingdom, they took them captives, but they also transplanted others there. They commingled uh, the populations. Anyway, the Samaritans were hostile. Uh, During all of this, uh, Cyrus dies. He was their benefactor, so he's passed away. His successor, Cambyses, who's also called Azurus, uh, was pressured by others to stop the work. So the work on the temple ceases. People all start going about their private affairs, busily you know, planting and growing and raising families, and they, they're they not focusing on the building of the temple. They gradually get used to the idea of worshiping there. Where they have sacrifices. They have the Torah sacrifices, but they don't have a temple. They get used to that, so they're complacent. They shrug it off. It's interesting, their desire to rebuild the temple starts to die out. They just became destined, if nothing else happened, to be uh, secular occupants in an impoverished land. And it's in this climate that God sends Haggai to challenge the people. It's a major, major turning point in their history. In fact, I imagine very few scholars appreciate how big a turning point, and I'll show you that at the end. Now, what makes this book interesting to us is just as we pass through the scripture, it's a little different than the prophecy books we've been reading. Very often, the prophets we've been reading are prophets that are beating up on people who are unbelievers, that are alien, that are really fallen away. That's not what's going on here. This book is preaching to the remnant, the remnant that returned. These are the right people. They are also in the right place. They're back in the homeland. The right people, the right place, at the right time. And they also uh, were pursuing the work on the temple for the right reasons. But there is a problem. They didn't have their priorities right. They allowed their own personal cares to get in the way of God's work. And we start putting that in focus, you can begin to see, gee, maybe that might be saying something to all of us. These are the, it's being addressed to people who are caught up in their own pursuits. They're living for themselves rather than God's glory. The right people, the right place, the right time, 
for the right reasons, but still something's missing called action. Now, you can begin to see where this is headed, can't you? I can tell that because you're looking a little uncomfortable. Right? <laughs> Chapter 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of uh, Yozadek, the high priest, saying, um, and he goes on. Now, this is probably Darius uh, uh, Histopes. Uh, uh, he began his reign about um, uh, 520 B.C. You'll notice it's starting to count the time from Gentile kings. This is a reminder to those of you that are alert that this is the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles began with Nebuchadnezzar. The times of the Gentiles will conclude with a coming world leader who's probably alive today. The word Zerubbabel, by the way, means sown in Babylon. And he's the grandson of Jehoiachin from 1 Chronicles 3. He was appointed by Cyrus to be governor of Judah. So he is in the Davidic line, but he's not a king. He is in the line of David, but there's no king on the throne of David from, uh, from the Babylonian captivity until Christ returns. The, the throne of David uh, is uh, unoccupied as, by, by a king, even though Zerubbabel is in the line. We'll come back to Zerubbabel a bit. Uh, Joshua was the son of Yoshedek, which is the high priest at the time of the Babylonian captivity. When the Babylonians conquered the high priest, his son is the one that's now high priest here, Joshua. Verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts. The word of Lord of hosts, by the way, is 25 times in this little tiny book. Little two-chapter book. 25 times the Lord of hosts is referred to. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. The opposition of the Samaritans was very intense. So the people stopped work, rationalizing, well, it's just not God, it's not God's will. You know, it's interesting how easily it is for all of us when we encounter some obstacles. You know, you're trying to reach somebody, and you can never reach him. You keep getting a message, or, or he's not in. Or uh, you're trying to undertake some work, and there's some difficulty, and suddenly doors seem to close. How easy it is for all of us. In fact, the more intensely we're trying to walk by the Spirit, how easy it is for us to rationalize. Well, it's not the Lord's timing. See? Here they're back in the land. They start to build the temple. They get into all these obstacles, all kinds of hassles. It goes on and on and on. And they conclude comfortably, conveniently, well, it's not the Lord's timing. So they go back to building their houses, going back to raising their families and whatever. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people, the term implies that the Lord is displeased. You know, it's interesting, when you travel a lot within a, well, certain kinds of Christian communities, it's interesting how the Lord led me to do this, then the Lord led me to do that. It's interesting how the Lord seems to change his mind a lot, you know? <laughs> Right? When you chuckle, I know you can think of your own examples of that. Whenever I, I think of cliches, we're all in, in the Christian community, we always use cliches. I have to work into the talk my favorite story about the guy that bought the horse. A guy in, the, in, in uh, western Pennsylvania, uh, as you know, the farmers there have a, a reputation for raising outstanding animals. So anyway, he was concluding this deal with the, one of these uh, Farmers in West Pennsylvania and uh, starting to trade with the horse and settle the, the, the payment. And the farmer says, there's one thing I forgot to tell you, is that we raise our horses out here with a little different command structure. There's a four-gated animal, and if you want it to upgrade, uh, up a gate and so forth, you simply say, praise the Lord. And uh, I forgot to tell you that. He said, well, that, that's, he's, the guy says, that's no problem. I went to Calvary Chapel once. I, I, uh, I can relate to that. So uh, he pays the guy, and, and uh, they trade with the horse, and he's on his way back home. But as all of us are, you know, we get impatient, we buy something new. He couldn't resist. He pulls over the side of the road, untrailers the horse. He has to try it out. So he saddles it up, and, and uh, there's a nice little trail going through some trees. So he, he uh, says, praise the Lord, and the horse goes in a very comfortable walk, and he gets a little more confidence. He says, praise the Lord, and it goes into a nice, tight, spirited trot. And it kind of opens up, so he says, praise the Lord, and it goes into a canter. <laughs> 
But this is gorgeous flat meadow, so he just can't resist to really try this animal out. So he says, praise the Lord again, and it goes in, the horse goes into a just a full gallop. And he is going like the wind, and he's really enjoying this animal. When he realizes several things all at once, he realizes, first of all, he realizes meadow ends in a cliff that drops several hundred feet. He also realizes he forgot to ask the guy how to bring this animal to a halt. So he does all the usual things. He, he says, whoa, and halt, and stop, everything he can think of, and is racing like the wind to the edge. At, in extremis, at the last instant, he gets an inspiration. He says, amen. <laughs> and his horse plants four hooves in the ground and comes to a stop about eight inches before this 200-foot drop, and the guy says, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> I was told that story years ago by the head of the Federal Communications Commission over lunch in Washington. I was, I, uh, it was a different context altogether, but I love that story because it, it, it's funny, and it, yet it also gets, it, it illustrates that we can get into trouble using cliches, and we all do. In this case, uh, we have Haggai treating one of those cliches. These guys are saying it's not the will of the Lord. So then verse 3 comes Haggai's mission. Then came the word of the Lord to Haggai the prophet, uh, excuse me, by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you, O ye, who to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? See, the sealed houses means they were beautifully paneled. See, they'd been living there. They, they provided for themselves. Their, their homes were elegant, but there was no temple that had been built. They put their own houses before God's house. Verse 5. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. What the Hebrew really says is, set your heart on your ways. That phrase occurs twice in chapter 1 and three times in chapter 2. It might be, in a sense, the key byword of this book. Consider your ways. Let me ask you a question, gang. What is your most important stewardship? We all call ourselves stewards before the Lord. We all uh, have studied to some degree stewardship. What is your most important stewardship? And of course, your wives will tell you, well, it's the family. Not a bad candidate. What is your most important stewardship? Certainly not money. I think we're all smart enough to at least give lip service to that idea. Right? What is your most important stewardship? I'm going to suggest it's your heart. I'm going to suggest it's your heart. See, that was their problem. It was, where was their heart? And we could go through about 17 Bible verses on that one, but I don't think we need to. That's pretty straightforward, self-evident. So let's just move on. The Lord continues in verse 6. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. They must have had socialist governments even back then. Huh? <laughs> See, God was already judging them in material things. They were working hard, but not prospering. Right? And God is, it's interesting, God has pointed to that, like saying, hey you guys, don't you get the message? I wonder how often it is that what we call bad luck is God's way of trying to get our attention. I won't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> I won't ask for a show of hands. If we understand the scripture right, I think I can assert that difficulties can only come to a child of God for a purpose. Difficulties can come in our path only for a purpose if we're children of God. All our difficulties are father filtered. I'll give you lots of uh, scripture on that. It's interesting as we, maybe just because I've just come back from this financial conference, but it's interesting if you were a serf in the feudal period, you worked several months of the year for your, the lord of the lands, right? <laughs> Over 50% of your year goes to taxes in our present society. You work over six months. Everybody has different cutoff dates. And I'm not just talking about federal. You know, ag sta ad state, property, all these other things. We're ignoring the hidden taxes called inflation. That really, well, I won't get into all that here. That's a 
So what's the solution? Is it political activism? I don't think so. I'm not disparaging that. That has its place. But I don't think that's the, that's the, the solution that's in, in view here. The solution here is uh, obedience. Is obedience. The solution here for uh, people of Haggai were uh, to get on with what God had called them to do. I think the solution for us, too, it comes out of Second Chronicles 7.14. Where God announces a principle to Solomon. That if my people who are called by my name, he's not talking to Bill Clinton or Hillary or the senators or the congressmen, he's talking to you and I. If my people who are, how, how many of you are God's people? Just want to sort of check that out. Okay, good. That's about 80%. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> how many of you are God's people that are called by his name, that people know you're God's people, huh? Eh, about 30%. All right, okay. I'm kidding a little. Okay. <laughs> if, my people who are, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, oh, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That's quite a promise. If we're worried, when you read the d- dismal reports of the incompetence and the degenerates that populate our capital, the answer is in the prayer closet, not the ballot box. Not that there isn't a stewardship issue at the ballot box. But uh, if you are grumbling about the daily news that comes across your breakfast table or the radio or whatever, then my question is, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed for a revival in this country? Because the problem is immorality in the body of Christ. Anyway, verse 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. There it is again. What does Matthew 6.33 say? Seek ye second the kingdom of God. Is that what it is? No, no. Huh? Seek ye first, huh? The kingdom of God and His righteousness. By the way, just to decide, we can get into a whole side discussion on this. I'll resist the temptation. But money can be spiritual. Money is simply means. The love of money is the root of all evil indeed. But don't... Money itself is means. It is simply means that need to be, needs to be applied. Its color is taken from what it's being applied to, right? Your home can be spiritual. It can be as sacred as your sanctuary. It can be as sacred as, a, uh, as your church. It can be as sacred as whatever. Then he, get, he get, gives them a command to do three things. Verse 8. Go up to the mountain, bring wood... And build the house. And I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Command of three simple things. Go to the mountain, bring the wood, build the house. Call to action. No profound theology, no eloquent poetry, none of the types of things that often um, uh, we encounter in the Scripture. This is just direct, practical, shoe leather, Theology here. Go do it. The implication here is that life... Does life seem to be complicated to you? Does your life seem to get complicated? How many of your life is getting complicated? Okay. The rest of you, those without your hands up, are likely to lie about other things too. (laughs) Life is not complicated if you put God first. That's the message. I don't know if you believe that. If you do, apply it. If you don't, well... We'll take another book next week. God favors work. And that's really what Haggai is. He's the, I, I call him the shoe leather prophet here. And I don't think, as a practical matter, just in, in the pragmatics of life, there's any shortcuts that work. I think you see every successful businessman, every successful whatever, fill in the blank, that behind that's a lot of hard work. They're not eight to five people. People, if you see in business, in any profession, in any business, you, the one thing you see, it isn't the brightest people that win. A lot of bright guys in Skid Row. A lot of lunkheads running big corporations. And there are a lot of studies on this, by the way. The one characteristic is persistence. Guys who hang in there and do it and keep moving win. The frightening thing is to win and maybe may found out you're in the wrong race. Some of these uh, uh, wonderful careers you see extolled in our society are marvelous until you 
sit back and figure out what did it cost them? What did it cost them at the expense of everything else? So there's something to be said for bound. But the point is application, commitment. And why should it be any different in things of God? Holy Spirit never blesses laziness. I can't find it anywhere. I've looked hard. I can't find it anywhere. And yet we live in a day of spectator sports and spectator Christianity. We live in a day of spectator Christianity. I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you are, have Bible fellowships in your home or in the neighborhood? How many of you um, have rolled up your sleeves for the Lord as part of your routine? There was a guy that was in Guatemala working for one of the missionary operations there that was a dentist. And from 8 to 5 each day, he fixed teeth of the various ministry people that that organization supported. And, of course, in the evening he went home. On his passport, he's called a missionary because he worked for XYZ missionary organization. But he's a dentist by training. In Long Beach, there was a guy that was a dentist. He pulled teeth you know, from 8 to 5, whatever. But then in the evening, he went and taught a Bible study. He's another week somewhere. His pastor would say he's a dentist. Remember, Chuck Smith used to point out that uh, the one guy's passport said he was a missionary. He was really a dentist. The other guy claimed he's a dentist. <laughs> he was really a missionary. Spectator Christians. That's none of us, I'm sure. Let's move on. Verse 9. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. When ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste. And ye run every man unto his own house. <laughs> See, they only had zeal for their own interests. And it's interesting, God is going to elaborate on this, but he brought the drought. He's caused them. God caused them to be less than successful because they weren't paying attention to his needs. He's trying to get their attention. I don't want to wait till the end to make the point. As we watch this, let's take a look at America. Has God been trying to get our attention? He puts a bulldozer blade on most of central Florida, called Hurricane Andrew, sends a flood throughout the Midwest, sends earthquakes, fires, riots throughout California. Make your list. Is he trying to get our attention? No one pays any attention, do they? Verse 10, God continues, Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. See, they had no rain. They had no crops. They had a hair-curling trade deficit. Verse 11, And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, upon, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. By the way, famine in Scripture is often an instrument of God's wrath. In 2 Kings 8, Psalm 105, 16 makes mention to it. And the Torah predicted this. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, and elsewhere. A lot of places. God does use drought for these things. Now it's interesting, God here tells Israel he's responsible. Because they neglected him. So it gets back to 2 Chronicles 7.14. Are we blaming Washington or are we blaming ourselves? See, Haggai would say, look in the mirror. Verses uh, 12 through 15 are the response then to Haggai's challenge. Unlike some of the prophets that we've studied where they, they're beating their fists on the table to make a point and then no one listens. They listened. They responded. Verse 12. Then... Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Yosedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. And as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. So they obeyed God and they feared him. Boy, that's pretty straightforward. I understand that William Gladstone, the famous British statesman, was asked about what was the mark. What is the mark of a great statesman? And his response was, uh, a statesman is a man who knows the direction God is moving for the next 50 years. What an interesting definition. We don't have men that know God at all, let alone where he's going in the next 50 minutes. huh? Verse 13, Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. What comforting words those are. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. 
There's a song. I was trying to find it. I couldn't get lay my hands on it. I wish I could re knew who, who the singer was. It's gone around here in recent years. I will be with you. It's a, one of the Calvary gang that uh, does a beautiful job. I'll be with you. I will be with you. For that's who I am. I can remember driving my car down from Big Bear, going through bankruptcy, watching my whole life go down the rat hole. I had a $5 million policy on my life. I would have solved all the apparent problems. Every oncoming car was an opportunity. And I can remember that song saving my life. I will be with you. You see, the ultimate insult is the ultimate ingratitude is to take matters in your own hands. Do you trust them or don't you? And that wasn't a mood for a day or two. That was for over a period of almost a year. What a comfort when you know, when you realize, when you're aware that God is with you. I will be with you, for that's who I am, he says. Verse 14. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Yosedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts their God. By the way, Shealtiel, it happens to mean asking of God in prayer. These leaders had their sleeves rolled up. They had leadership, but they also had action. And verse 15 points out this is the four and twentieth day of the sixth month in the year of Darius the king. There have only been 23 days from verse 1 to verse 15. Isn't that interesting? 15 days from the challenge to action. But it's not over. They get discouraged. Chapter 2, first nine verses, deals with their discouragement and God's encouragement. Verse 1. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord uh, by the prophet Haggai, saying... Now, they've been working, by the way, about a month. And incidentally, this, is, turns out, is the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. If you, if you look at Leviticus 23 and put that all together, the Feast of Tabernacles is a seven-day feast, and this is the seventh day of the, the last day, the climactic day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of, the feast of Ingathering. And they, we can presume that they were trying to rush to get it ready for that festival, of course. Verse 2, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Yozadek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes? In comparison of it is nothing. Many people that were in the captives that returned to the land could remember the temple that Solomon built that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar on the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th of Av. I've always been troubled by that because they celebrate that on the 9th of Av, but it turns out if you look at the scripture, you'll find it's the 10th of Av, except it also started on the 7th, and there's a whole thing about that. But the point is on the 9th of Av of that month, the 9th of that month is when Nebuchadnezzar burned the temple, Solomon's temple, when they took him captive some 70 years earlier. When the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD, they burned it on the 9th of Av. So that day on the Hebrew calendar is a very, very significant day for a lot of reasons. Several other things. A number, half a dozen different setbacks, uh, persecutions, what have you, happened to Israel on that particular day of the calendar. But the point is that some of the people who are participating in the rebuilding of the temple are disappointed because it's so meager, it's so modest, it is nothing. It made, they were weeping because they remembered the glory of Solomon's temple. This thing was so meager, so common, so, so modest. God is speaking to Zerubbabel and Joshua and to the resident of the people who are saying this. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as nothing? They didn't have much of a budget. They had a fairly a generous offering that was pulled together. Still, it's modest compared to Solomon's. They, there was probably over $100 million worth of gold just on the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple. And in Ezra 3, it gets into all of this. But now God, in response to that, in response to the fact that what they're doing, they're very disappointed in the results. They're very modest. Verse 4. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Yosedek, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord. And work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be strong. Three times in this verse. To Zerubbabel, to Joshua, and to the people. Be strong. It's interesting to notice how often in the Bible... The messenger of God, 
admonishes us to be strong. So many, many places. Let's just take a look at a few of those. Turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. In verse 6, Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. See, the, the, the strength is reflected in their obedience. Which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right or to the left, that thou mayest prosper in whatever thou goest. You want the secret to prosperity? Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thou goest. We need those words, because I do believe we're heading into troubled times. We've had many decades here of pretty comfortable existence in our country. But I think it, it's clear that we're entering some major, major changes, and we need to remember this. Uh, there are many, many other passages. The other p- passage, of course, one of the last ones, is in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. And boy, I think we really need to master Ephesians, chapter 6. Verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. As we look at the world scene, as we look at the threats on our society, as we look at the shambles of our nation, both morally, economically, militarily, let's keep in mind where our power really comes from. It's from His might. And from verse 11 on, you need to master that. That's an evening study in its own right. But you need to be prepared for spiritual warfare, and don't confine your spiritual warfare to the armament that you wear. Because that, from verses 12 to 17 is usually rendered as your spiritual armor. Don't forget the heavy artillery. That's verse 18. Praying always. Action at a distance. Okay. Well, anyway, back to Haggai, so I don't get too far afield here, because I've got something I want to put at the end of this. So, verse 5. God continues, According to the word I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. The covenant, of course, he's talking about is the one at Sinai. It's interesting, he says he was among them. Is he among us? No, he's in us. Big difference, by the way. But moving on, verse 6. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Verses 6 through 9 are a very famous passage, very distinctly messianic. You will hear this quoted a lot. It's quoted in the book of Hebrews. It, It echoes throughout the scripture. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Now these words are going to be repeated to Zerubbabel directly later on in this chapter, in verses 21 through 22. It's interesting how the world history, right after Haggai wrote this in the coming century or two, so literally fulfills this. The Ionian Greeks had been subject to the rule of the Persians under Cyrus about 540 B.C. 501 B.C., about 20 years after Haggai prophesied this, the Greeks rebelled against Persia and bringing on an invasion of the Persians against the Greeks about a decade later. Darius the king at this time led a great army but was defeated at Marathon in 490 B.C., a date that's dear in the memory of the Greeks. And his successor, Xerxes, then, marshaled an even larger army of 1.8 million men under arms and a gigantic navy, the largest navy that had ever been put together. But in 480 B.C., the Greeks scattered the navy and defeated the army. A year later, the reassembled Persian navy was again defeated. As the Persian Empire starts to crumble, Alexander the Great, of course, crosses the Bosporus against Persia, defeats the Persian armies at Granicus in 334, Isis in 332, and Arbella in 331, and thus sets up the Greek Empire. And, of course, after his death, it falls apart. The Rome takes over. But clearly, the centuries that followed Haggai's prophecy, indeed, God really shook the nations. The overthrow of the Persians, the Greeks, and, and so forth, are often pointed to by commentators with regard to this prophecy. But having said all of that, I don't think that's what it applies to. I think it's messianic. The reason I say that is because in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 12, the writer to Hebrews, which I believe was Paul, applies Haggai's words about the shaking of the nations to God's final judgment. 
There he changed his light. He says, once more and I shake the nation. So you can look at it, as many scholars look at it, the immediate history after Haggai being just a foreshadowing of what's ultimately coming. But there's another phrase here that gets a lot of, there's a lot of controversy about, and that's this phrase, the desired of the nations. The Christian community sees that as Jesus Christ. There are many interpretations for this. The problem is there's a feminine singular subject with a plural verb in the Hebrew. And because it's a plural verb, uh, some scholars, Thomas Moore and others, regard this as really referring to the wealth of the nations. And that seems to be suggested because in the verse later, God is going to say the gold and silver belong to me. So it implies that maybe what he's reading is that which the nations desire, gold and silver. Because they argue that the nations don't desire Christ, they resist him. So that, that title bothers some, some scholars. Uh, others believe that because the plural it refers to his chosen, his elect. But um, it's interesting, the earliest Christian traditions and also Hebrew scholars uh, ascribe this passage to be messianic. The grammar is not an objection because in the Hebrew, an abstract noun is often placed in place for, the, uh, for a concrete. And sometimes the verb can be agree with the second noun in a series. So those issues uh, by Feinberg uh, uh, and others uh, argue in favor of the traditional view that this is a, the desire of the nations is an allusion to indeed the Messiah as he ultimately comes. But then God says, the glory of this house shall be greater. Now this is interesting. See, what the people are discouraged by, they're going ahead and they, they're building this thing, but it ain't much compared to the glory of Solomon's temple. And they're re-down, they're re-discouraged. And God's saying that the glory of this house will be greater. It's interesting that Zerubbabel's temple, after um, the Romans conquered Judea, and they appoint an Edomite, Herod the Great, as the king, Herod decides to remodel this thing. He tears it down to the foundations and builds a whole new one. You and I would call it the third temple, but it's still called the second temple. But the point is, that's the temple that Jesus Christ came to. And that's the illusion here. The uh, Shekinah, the, the cloud by day, the fire by night, it occupied the first temple. But it also departed from the first temple long before it was de- the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, probably during the days of Manasseh. The Shekinah glory, as it's called, was not in the second temple. It was only in the first. It was in the tabernacle, led him to the wilderness, was in the tabernacle. It was in Solomon's temple. But it departs from Solomon's temple prior to the judgment of the Babylonians. It departed when God had set them for judgment, probably in the days of Manasseh. Now, Matthew 12, 6 says, One greater than the temple is here, referring to Jesus Christ. So the glory that came to the second temple vastly eclipsed the glory of Solomon's temple, in that sense. And, of course, the Shekinah is going to appear again, we know. By the way, the Babylonian Talmud points out there are five things missing from the temple of Zerubbabel. The Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Fire from Heaven, the Urim and Thummim, the Shekinah, the visible glory, and the uh, Spirit of Prophecy, the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting. Everybody's interested in the Ark of the Covenant. They're talking about building the, the third temple in Jerusalem. Where's the Ark of the Covenant? You don't need the Ark of the Covenant. The rabbis believe it's under the, uh, uh, under the Temple Mount, and we could spend all evening on that one. But the point is, uh, the truth of the matter is, the Tosefta, the Tanakh, and also the, uh, well, primarily the Tosefta points out, you do not need the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was not in the Second Temple. We'll see what's going to happen with uh, the Ark of the Covenant as, as the days unfold. But the Messiah came to Zerubbabel's Temple, in effect, or Herod's Temple, if you want to call it that. God continues, verse 8, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former, saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And by the way, it really, it's, really, it's not the glory of this latter house, it's really the latter glory of this house, is the proper Hebrew translation. The latter glory. God always speaks of his temple as singular, as this house, whether it's the first temple, the second temple, or Ezekiel's temple. It's his house in concept all the way through. It's the latter glory he's talking about. But now... He, He goes on, verse 10, in the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, now by the way, this turns out to be uh, the day before Hanukkah, but Hanukkah doesn't get celebrated for centuries later, but I mean, just in terms of God's calendar, it's always interesting to keep those things in mind. Hanukkah celebrates the rededication of the temple after it's desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes in 135 B.C., some more than three or four centuries later 
but still it's interesting that this it's on this, on that calendar. And of course Hanukkah is authenticated by John, the Gospel writer, in John chapter 10. So that comes as a surprise to many Christians to realize that Hanukkah has a biblical role. Verse 11, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying... Now he's challenging the priests here. He's going to enunciate a very important spiritual principle. Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? The priest answered and said no. In other words, holiness isn't transmitted by contact. Holiness isn't contagious. If you have holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and your skirt touched something, does that make what it touched holy? And the priest answered appropriately, no. And you could go to Leviticus 6 and, and um, 7 and 22 and a lot of places to, you know, you can get into the Torah and build all that. I won't take the time here. Verse 13. Then said Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Very interesting concept here. Something that's holy doesn't transmit that holiness by contact. Something that's unholy does. If you study the ritual law, if you study the Torah, if that's why a Jew would not want to touch something dead, because he becomes ritually unclean, has a whole procedure to go through. That's why they marked all the tombs. See, around Passover time, they had visitors from all over. Every able-bodied Jew had to be in Jerusalem for Passover, actually for a Feast of Unleavened Bread, but they used Passover connotatively to refer to the first three feasts. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits. That's one of the three feasts. The other one was Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, and also the Feast of Tabernacles. Every able-bodied Jew had to be in Jerusalem. So around those holiday periods, there were crowds of people that were tourists. Well, if they inadvertently went over a grave site, they were ritually unclean and couldn't celebrate the Passover. So what they did is they marked them all with whitewash. So around the holiday period, all the graves get marked so that a stranger won't inadvertently you know, travel there. Because that was such a familiar site, that's why Jesus could make that remark, ye are like whitewashed sepulchers, but inside full of dead men's bones. In other words... Um, he's using that idiomatically, but of course, that uh, the whole idea of a, uh, the whole idea of marking them was to prevent becoming ritually unclean. Touching something that's unholy made them ritually unholy. And and what we have here in these two verses is a just a summary of the ritual law in the Torah. So holiness cannot be communicated by contact, but unholiness can. Dirty water will discolor clean water. By pouring clean water in a glass of dirty water, does the water, dirty water become clean? Not really. Measles is communicated by contact. Can the absence of measles be communicated by contact? That's the analogy. Maybe a clumsy one, but an analogy. And by the way, ceremony cannot cleanse a sinner. You cannot run with the wrong crowd and stay clean. And as uh, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is what, is a, what is a human heart like? Desperately, in fact, the term is incurably wicked. God never cures our heart. He gives us a new one. Interesting. If we could see ourselves, we probably couldn't stand ourselves if we saw him as God saw us. I'm always reminded in Shakespeare's Macbeth, Lady Macbeth walking her sleep, rubbing her hand and exclaiming, Out, damn spot! Out, I say! Here's the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. How true. Or the heart either. And of course there's lots of scripture, and again I'll, I'll spare you that. Verse 14. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, that that which they offer there is unclean. Their unclean hearts made their service for the Lord unclean. And that's why the strange idea emerges from the Scripture that an, an unsaved person can do nothing that's acceptable to God. Because he's unsaved. Salvation comes first. You don't get saved by works. But once saved, then your works count. You follow me? That's the concept. Verse 15, And now I pray you, consider this day and upward, that from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. 
Since those days were, when one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to a press fat to draw out fifty vessels out of the press, there were but twenty. Press fat was when they, you know, getting the wine out of the wine press. When you expected fifty, there were only twenty. He says, I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands. Yet ye turn not to me, saith the Lord. Consider now, from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. By the, the ninth month, by the way, is the month of Kislev on their calendar. That's the month of Hanukkah. That's the month that they later rededicate the temple after it was desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes. I think there's, there's some interesting modeling one might do here. Verse 19. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, and as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth. From this day I will bless you. And now he goes on to reveal his program. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying... Two me- and incidentally, there are two messages the same day, if you've been watching this. One was the people, now this is to Zerubbabel. Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, I will s- destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Now, by the way, in verse 22, I will overthrow the throne of the kingdoms. Do you notice something interesting there? It's singular. A lot of kingdoms, a lot of nations in the scope of this passage. One throne. A lot of people are sort of aware that, the, that our world seems to be run by a conspiracy. Libraries are full of the so-called conspiracy theory books. There indeed is a conspiracy. Because there is a master conspirator. And it ain't David Rockefeller. <laughs> it ain't the head of the house of Rothschild, whatever these people may be guilty of, the real master conspirator is none other than whom? Satan. Satan. Exactly right. There's one supreme rule over the earth. It's permitted by God for a while. But there's going to be a replacement soon. (laughs) Hallelujah is right. Verse 23. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheltiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Notice he says, in that day, not this day, that day. This is yet future. The signet. The signet was an authentication of royalty, technically a ring or an emblem that would be pressed on a seal to authenticate that the message really came. It was a, it was a form of identity, authentication. Uh, and uh, Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, appears in each of the genealogies of the Messiah. Many people get confused by that, because if you study the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, you find Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, in both of them. But they're in different generations. They're not the same guy. Some people think they are. It doesn't work. But it's interesting that that uh, identity authenticates both the genealogies. The temple was indeed completed about four years later. They viewed it as meager, but God viewed it as great because of Matthew 12, 6. Now, there is a lot more to talk about here, and I think I've allowed myself a little time to get into another issue here. We're dealing here with the exile, the post, you know, they've come back from Babylon. They're starting a period of their history, uh, the post-exile era. And between here and, of course, the New Testament period, there's a lot that goes on, the book of Esther and a lot of other things. But I tend to get fascinated with uh, these, this preoccupation with dates. And one of the interesting things is if you go through the calendar and go through the calendarization carefully, you'll discover that the period between the temples, when the temple was burned down and the temple was rebuilt, turns out to be 25,200 days, or precisely 70 years, taking 360-day years. Uh, Many people are aware in broad terms that it was 70 years for the captivity, and it was also 70 years for the desolations of Jerusalem. Well, let me back up. There are two phrases in the Old Testament. The servitude of the nation of Israel, when they went into captivity under Babylon, that was predicted to be 70 years. And indeed it was. There's also the phrase, the desolations of Jerusalem. And they were predicted to be 70 years. And most commentators fall into the trap of presuming those two phrases mean the same thing. And uh, Sir Robert Anderson and some other more perceptive scholars point out that they are not, they are both 70 years, but they're not coterminous. They they, they deal with different things. The servitude of the nation is one thing. 
The desolation of the Jerusalem is another. And it will be useful, before I get into something else here, to highlight the whole situation with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar laid three sieges to Jerusalem. He succeeded in the Battle of Karshemish, in which he defeated the Egyptians, and thus made Babylon the number one power in that region. And then he lays siege to Jerusalem. During the siege, he finds his father died, so he's no longer just general, he's, he's uh, king of Babylon. So he sets up a vassal king, takes hostages to assure loyalty, namely Daniel and his friends and some others, plunders the temple, goes home. First siege of Nebuchadnezzar. It triggers a period of time in which from that point on, the house of Judah was slaves to Babylon. They were subject to Babylon. Some were deported, some still lived there, but they were subject to Babylon as a province, as a, uh, the king was a vassal king. The false prophets put on, ultimately put him on an ego trip where he rebels against Nebuchadnezzar to throw off the yoke. The false prophets said, we're God's people, uh, God will deliver us. Jeremiah and Ezekiel both preach against that, don't do that. Nebuchadnezzar is God's instrument of judgment. You are to yield to him. That's what God's instruction was to, through, through those two prophets. But ultimately, of course, the king gets on his ego trip and rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar lays a second siege. These sieges lasted a couple of years. Typically. I mean, they weren't just a day, a, you know, a weekend kind of deal. But anyway, he lays siege, again puts them down, and substitutes Zedekiah as the, the nephew, as the king, goes back to Babylon. Same story. Zedekiah gets put on an ego trip by the false prophets. Again, Jeremiah and Ezekiel both tell him, don't do that. In fact, he even throws Jeremiah in prison as a traitor, because he's on this Babylon kick. And uh, Zedekiah ultimately rebels against Nebuchadnezzar, which leads to the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Jeremiah and Ezekiel had been preaching that if you don't yield to Nebuchadnezzar, God is going to destroy Jerusalem. If you read your Bible casually, you may not pick up on this. Being slaves are one thing. Having the city destroyed is another. The third siege of Nebuchadnezzar starts a period called the Desolations of Jerusalem because in the third siege, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't just plunder the temple and takes captives. He takes them all captives and he levels the place. He's had enough of all of this. And so he goes home. That starts a period called the Desolations of Jerusalem. Now, 70 years from the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon falls to the Persians. Cyrus the Persian releases them to go home. The, the servitude of the nation is over. But Jerusalem's still in rubble. Okay? Seventy years from the desolation of the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar, Jerusalem's reestablished. Not completely, there's other things going on, but that's, that's the point. Now, the reason I'm getting into this, there's a very, very strange prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 4. And in the interest of time, I'll just summarize it. Basically, Ezekiel is told to reckon out 430 years. He does this. There's a whole series of strange things God has Ezekiel do. He acts these out in the marketplace. One place is he sits and he makes a little sandbox, puts a little wall and puts a pen. And it's his way. It's it, it, communicating to the people that they're going to be besieged and so forth. Well, he's told to lay on the side. Not, not all day, but ceremonially. For 430 days. For 430 days, he goes out and lays on the side. And anyway, the point is, what the message of it is, as explained in Ezekiel 4 is 430 years of judgment are predicted upon the nation. Now, this is the only place in the Bible where it expressly says it's a day for a year. The days are intended to lay out 430 years of judgment. Now, 70 years we can account for, because that's the Babylonian captivity. That leaves a problem period that scholars wrestle with, because you take 70 from 430 you have 360 years of judgment. Where do they fit in? And it turns out you can play all kinds of games. They don't seem to fit anything very cleanly. And that's just one of these problem passages in prophecy. Many years ago, gosh, almost 15, 20 years ago, I was reading one conjecture. Someone pointed out in Leviticus 26, four different times in that book, it implies that if you don't obey me the first time, I'm going to multiply your punishments by seven. And this particular scholar says, gee, let's take that literally and see what happens. 
they uh, they didn't pay the first time. They go, okay, what would what is seven times three hundred and sixty? It turns out to be twenty five hundred and twenty years. And they said that's interesting because that's roughly the period of time from the Babylonian captivity when that was all over to the when Israel's regathered in the land. I was intrigued by that, and yet it bothered me because you never, I don't believe you ever use the word approximate or about and God in the same sentence. It either fits or it doesn't, you know. But I also was intrigued to notice that nobody that I could find had ever applied the lessons we've learned from Sir Robert Anderson and Daniel 70 Weeks and all that, that God deals in 360-day years. And we could spend all night explaining why that goes on. But basically in Genesis, if you notice, there are always 12, 30-day months that make up a year in the way that God reckons the time. In the book of Revelation, the same thing. So for, for a number of reasons we, we could just speculate on, God seems to deal in 360-day years in terms of his reckoning of time. And so I thought, that's interesting. I don't know if anybody has ever applied that to this theory that, gee, maybe you take the, the 2,520 years and treat those as 360-day years, not 365. I wonder where that leads. And so, in other words, you take 430 minus 7, it gives you 360. If you multiply the, three, the missing, the problem years by 7, you get 2,520 years. Well, 2,520 years, if you render them as on a 360-day basis, just multiply that out, is 907,200 days. I know that excites you. The question is, what is that on our calendar? If you render that into our way of reckoning, well, let's see, that requires a little explanation. See, the real problem you've got is uh, leap years. You ever notice leap years? The Julian year is 11 minutes and 10.46 seconds longer than the mean solar year. Therefore, the Julian calendar contains three leap years too many every four centuries. This one day per four doesn't quite do it, okay? In 1752 A.D., they recognized that there was an error, and uh, they had an error of 11 days accumulate by then, and that was all corrected by what's called the Gregorian calendar reform. And they declared uh, September 3rd to be September 14th, thus picking up those 11 days. And they also changed the formula so that the even century years were non-leap years. In other words, 1700, 1800, 1900 are common years. The year 2000 will be a leap year to keep the thing sort of in balance. Well, anyway, the problem is how do you get the dates for the leap years? Well, you see, if you take 2,484, you get a little too many. So 2,483 years, if you divide that by four, you've got 621 days you've got to add, except you get three too many for each century. That gives you 18 too many. But 11 have already been corrected for on our calendar. So that means you've got uh, seven that you have to deal with. So if you take the 721, drop off the 7, you've got 614 leap days, if I can call them that. You with me so far? That, so anyway, the way this works out, 2,483 years, 9 months, and 21 days will add up to 907,200. So what, that's a long way of saying that the 2,520 years on a 360-day basis on our calendar would add up to 2,483 years, 9 months, and 21 days. And I know your pulses are quickening with excitement. What do you do with that? I don't know, but let's go on a little bit. Let's be consistent and also recognize that um, when we speak of 70 years, we're really talking about 25,200 uh, days. If you use 69 years, you're only two days off. Because again, we're dealing with three, we're going to be consistent with 360. You with me so far? Okay, now the question I have then is okay, where do I apply this? Well, the seven years bapt the servitude of the nation started in 606 B.C. 69 years after 606 is 537 B.C. And if you take July 23rd, 537 B.C., and you're going to add the 2,483 years, 9 months, and 21 days, you've got to remember there's no year zero. So you'll be off a year if you just do it alpha algebraically. But it's interesting to me that the servitude of the nation, Israel... If you take the Babylonian captivity, when that was completed, then count this peculiar period of time, you come to May 14th of 1948, the day when David Ben-Gurion, using Ezekiel as authority, announced on international radio that the name of the new Jewish homeland was Israel. What a coincidence. Huh? <laughs> well, that might be contrived. That's the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar. The servitude of the nation, the rebirth of the nation. 
The third siege of Nebuchadnezzar starts this period called the Desolations of Jerusalem. Take the 5, 587 B.C., take your 69 years, you get to 518. And by the way, if you take the 9th of Av and put it on our calendar, you're talking August 16th of 518 B.C. I'm using it as a minus year here. Again, there's no year zero, so you've got a one-year error if you do it algebraically. If you take, the, again, the 2,483 years, 9 months, and 21 days, you come to June 7th of 1967, when the first time that the city of Jerusalem, the old city, biblical Jerusalem, was under the control of the nation of Israel as a result of the Six-Day War. Interesting, interesting thing. Times of the Gentiles are coming to an end. It's interesting that the dating of all of this apparently is important enough in God's perception that he raised up Haggai in a little brief book which covered a little brief period of history but was entirely apparently focused on getting them to move to finish the temple. It also fascinates me. I think there's much more to be learned as we study this chronology because it's interesting that they finished that temple and dedicated on the anniversary in anticipation, unknowingly of course, of the dedication of the temple when it was rededicated after its desecration by Antiochus Epiphanes, who of course is a type of the Antichrist as Jesus points to him in Matthew 24, 15. That occurred several centuries later. But the timing, I think, is significant. The fact the Holy Spirit puts these months and times in there, I think, is for our learning. I think God rewards the diligence. So this is just conjectural, just a, a speculation, and yet I think it's interesting. I think it's exciting that Israel is getting ready to rebuild their temple. When are they going to rebuild it? I'm not sure. But I know it's at an appointed time. They're preparing. Jesus himself pointed again to the rebuilding of the temple as a major milestone prior to his second coming in Matthew 20, in the confidential briefing to his disciples. When four disciples got a confidential briefing, and the key to that briefing was the desecration of a temple that is now being prepared to be built. What an exciting time. But setting aside the chronology and the prophetic, the, you know, th those aspects of this, what's the real message of Haggai? Five times he says, consider your ways. He wasn't talking to unbelievers. He was talking to the remnant. He was talking to the right people that were in the right place at the right time who had the right motives. I'm going to suggest that all of us here are here at the right time. Most exciting time in history. And we're in the right place. He's where God has planted us. I think most of us here have the right motives. If I ask for a show of hands, how, much, how many of you would like to make uh, glorifying God the number one priority in life? How many would? How many would? That's great. We got an A plus in good intentions. But the book of Haggai is about shoe leather. I'm going to borrow a, 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 a something I learned from John Ankerberg back last fall. Hadn't planned on it, but I think I'm going to do that. We're going to close for a word of prayer, but I'm going to do, let's do this a little differently. Those of you that are willing to commit yourself to doing something for the Lord that the Holy Spirit will lead you to do, stand where you are. Just stand where you are. And just pray about it. And when the Lord tells you what it is that He would have you do, go ahead and be seated. Just pray in your own way to the Lord. Ask Him to show you what he would have of you in these days. Some unique ministry, some unique commitment, some unique thing in your life. And when the Holy Spirit speaks to you in some specific terms, something that you're going to undertake, something that you're going to commit yourself to in the immediate future, when you know what that is, go ahead and be seated. And now why don't we all just stand for a final closing prayer. Father, we, we just thank you for the ministry of Haggai. We thank you for your word, Father. We thank you for the example that that faithful remnant set. When they heard your word, they obeyed, and they feared you. And Father, as we become increasingly sensitive to the events on the horizon, as we become more and more aware of the signs of the times, as we become more aware that you're not far away from wrapping up this era of history as we know it. We just ask you indeed, Father, to 
light a path before us. Let us know those specific things that you'd have us do that we might be participants and not spectators only. That we might be sensitive to your priorities in our life, Father. That we indeed would be more diligent and more faithful at putting you first above our own cares and concerns. Help us, Father, to be ever more effective for you, not by power nor by might, but by your Spirit, Father. And as you've spoken to some here, Father, to, on some specific things, Father, we just pray that you would encourage, strengthen, and open the path before them. And Father, we would just all join in asking you to help each of us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. For we indeed we come before you in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.